Okay, I think we're good. Um, so you see that I've got this uh, blue tactical earbud in it right now. This is so that I'm, I've got a couple of people at the Foothills campus that couldn't come live. So I'll be uh, kind of trying to do that for them this way. And I just got this at the Ram Tech. So we're gonna see if this works. Now, lots of things testing today. Let's see. Nope, see that didn't. Guinea pigs. Guinea pigs, exactly, right? What's wrong with that? One, let's see. So my name is Pat Keys. Um, I don't think I'm gonna use that. All right. Um, my name is Pat Keys. I'm lead scientist at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. Thank you for coming today. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about a bunch of work that I've been doing around futures research. And I'll explain what that is uh, in a few moments. Um, and I'm happy to see that there are uh, uh, lots of folks here that I don't recognize because that means that this is hopefully gonna be new to you. Uh, maybe you'll learn something new uh, and you can take something with you. I hope to be done early so that there's time for questions and conversation, uh, such as that is. Uh, I'm not sure, this is the first time I've given this talk, it's hot off the press. So we will see how it goes and um, hopefully there's enough time for questions, yeah. Okay, so just in case you fall asleep, it's inevitable. It's kind of a warm room because there were people here already. So TLDR, too long, didn't read, that's internet abbreviation, uh, to say, if you fall asleep, this is what we're gonna cover. The Anthropocene challenges our ability to comprehend the present, um, let alone the future. Structured futuring can move beyond con constraints of model-based scenarios, and storytelling scenarios enable emotionally engaging and creative scenarios that can inspire and motivate. So very briefly though, the future. This is Gerard O'Neill. Anybody recognize that? Who this is, Gerard O'Neill, okay? It's an obscure, this is a reach. Uh, he's a former, well, uh, he's, he's dead now, but he was a rocket scientist for NASA. And among other things, uh, he was a, a theorist when it came to space colonization and other things. He also wrote this fantastic book called 2081 in the year 1981, where he did a systematic study of how people understand and interpret the future. And he said, most prophets overestimated how much the world would be transformed by social and political change, and underestimated the forces of technological change. At the end of the day, we, we were really, people were really excited about social change, political change, but then maybe they got the internet totally wrong, or they thought we were gonna keep using uh, rotary dial phones, for example. This is Malka Older, uh, among other things, she's a science fiction author. She wrote the uh, fantastic series of books starting with Infomocracy. And she says, if you look back 60 or 70 years from now, and think of people who might have been trying to imagine the world we're in today, it is unimaginable. Even the people who are most connected to technology would not have pictured this world and what the internet has done to change it. I think this is spot on. If you think about, you know, 60 or 70 years ago, that's the 50s, that's the 60s. Now, some people, you know, were thinking about, you know, futuristic rocket cars, who knows, you name it. Um, but the internet is so pervasive, it's invisible now. Everything we do is on the internet now. And so thinking about that in that context, we have to now project into the future. What is gonna be so unimaginable about the future that we can't even comprehend it? So this is something called the futures cone. Has anybody seen this before? Okay, yeah, okay. Well, right, I know you've seen it, got it. Um, so we are here in this now, okay? And this, this represents all the potential that is out there. And, and it was developed by Joseph Boros in the, uh, hold on a second. Okay, it was developed by Joseph Boris in, the, in 2003 and it's been updated a couple of times. And this is useful for understanding different ways we talk about the future. So let's start with this middle one, the projected future, the default extrapolated kind of linear projection. Now we go about around that, that blue circle, something like probable, this is current trends, things that might be likely to happen. Okay, and now we're ascribing the language of statistics, kind of the reducibility of the future. Beyond that, this kind of darker, kind of dark gray ring, we've got the plausible. So based on current knowledge, something that could happen. Now you might feel like this is just semantics. This is important semantics, especially for today. 
when we talk about things that are largely uh, quantitatively and possibly even objectively possible to think about in the future. We can reduce the complexity of a lot of these things to then come up with intelligent things to say. For example, climate scenarios. So this is very small, I'm sorry. I had no idea how big the screen would be. Um, and even though it's enormous, it's still quite small. It's a big room. What's that? Okay, so, so we can see that these are a whole bunch of different ranges of possible climate scenarios. Everything from the wildly ambitious, we do everything and incorporate uh, cutting edge carbon sequestration technology to the let's reverse car course and start emitting as much carbon as we possibly can. But this is, those are projections that are using these quantitative kind of objective approaches. Let's start going outside that a bit, the possible. Okay, so these are things, this is based on future knowledge. We might not even have this information yet. It could happen. An example, so anybody recognize this just off the top of your head out of curiosity? What's that? It's Antarctica, good. This is Thwaites Glacier. So, well, this is Thwaites Ice Shelf, I should specify. So in uh, December of last year, some scientists released some new findings that said that they expect that the Thwaites Ice Shelf uh, could collapse in the next five to 10 years. That is pretty, um, from an Antarctic science perspective, that's a big deal, okay? But that's, that's still now under this domain, right? Plausible, okay? Plausible, maybe even probable at this point. But what we don't know is Thwaites uh, Glacier. That's the ice that's behind that. The Thwaites Ice Shelf, that's not gonna matter for sea level rise. Thwaites Glacier, that will. And so that's something that we don't know what that's gonna look like. That's in the possible category. Next, we've got the preposterous. This one's my favorite, okay? Maybe not surprisingly. By the end of this, you'll know this is my favorite. Um, this means impossible won't ever happen. What's that? Ice-free Antarctica, okay? It's a green Antarctica. Well, it's green because it's based on elevation. So the green just means it's a little bit lower, closer to sea level. But the point here is that that's preposterous, right? It sort of is and it sort of isn't. It's been that way before. Okay, Antarctica has been ice free before. Now that in our lifetime, yeah, that's preposterous. Okay. So then the other one though, is this green one. This is the preferable. It stretches from the projected all the way out into the preposterous. So while all of those others are concerned with almost some concept of probability, the preferable is inherently different. Now we're talking about norms. We're talking about values. So what I wanna do is I wanna explain that we are not, if you came here thinking we're gonna talk about this, you can, it won't hurt my feelings, but you can leave now. We're not talking about that today. But you're extending into the preposterous. Oh, we're definitely going into, we're going to, uh, we're gonna be talking about the possible preposterous and preferable today. So radical futures, what is a radical future? It's a vision of the future that pushes the boundaries of social, environmental, and technological limits, possibly exceeding them. This is Jim Dator. He's professor and director of the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies, UH Manoa. If you didn't know future studies were a thing, they're a thing. And he's famously known for these two laws, Dator's laws for futures research. The future cannot be predicted because the future does not exist, which seems like a tautology, but it also means that the, the future contains multitudes. We just don't know what's gonna happen. And second, my favorite, the only useful ideas about the future should at first appear to be ridiculous, okay? And we'll come back to that. Why do we need radical futures? The future is gonna be a strange place compared to today, especially anything after 2070, all right? Technology change, social change, environmental change. The world may be unrecognizable to my parents, let alone my grandparents. It might even be unrecognizable to me right now. Like if I were to view what it looks like in 50 years time. Let's take an example. What is this? Come on, this is a participatory part. What is this? Exercise machine, right? Okay, so it's an ad like, so we know like even though we might not wear these garments if we were to go exercise today, maybe you would, I don't know. Um, it's clearly this is an ad for exercise equipment. How about this? Ellipticals are hamster wheels for humans. Fitness is fun on Quest 2, Oculus from Facebook. Okay, so who knows what this is? Okay, so somebody tell me. Yeah, virtual reality, okay. So, so, but how do you use this? Explain it to me. 
You put on it, it where is the headset? This is the headset? Do you like, just like, like how do you, it's like, okay, you stick it on. Okay, what are these things for? Do you hold them? Okay, so you know, like, I thought maybe you like put the, your arms through them. My point is, is that we have no context. You know that. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, so you know very well. Um, but if you, if this is all you saw, this is not clear that this is something that you wear and hold, okay? So if you were in the 70s and you saw this, you'd first go, I'm not sure I, I can interpret the snark here. Like, I don't even know what we're talking about. And then this says fitness is fun on Quest 2. So does this mean like, I'm gonna go over here and like sit on it? Like, what's this for? And then do like, I, do I hold, I stick my hand? I don't know. So the point is, is it as indecipherable as this would be to somebody in the 70s, there will be ads like that in the future that we would have no idea how to penetrate what they mean. So just as the technology has advanced, the social messaging has advanced too. Okay, so what are story-based scenarios? That's what we're gonna talk about. What are some examples of story-based scenario design? And what have we learned so far? So story-based scenarios. This is Kim Stanley Robinson. He's written uh, a lot of stuff. New York 2140, most recently Ministry for the Future. And he has this great comment on perspective. You can never properly predict the future as it really turns out. So you are doing something a little different when you write science fiction. You are trying to take a different perspective on now. So story-based scenarios. In order to explore the possible, the preposterous, and the preferable, we can use stories. Stories allow us to move beyond descriptions and toward textured visions that we can imaginatively inhabit, all right? This is not to say that we cannot use stories to talk about the projected, the, the probable, and the plausible. It's, they're still very good for that too. But there's this whole other domain of the future that stories are very well suited for. So what are some examples? I'm gonna talk, there's, this was a really hard talk to prepare because I didn't know what I wanted to share because there's so much I wanted to share. But I'm gonna zero in on three stories. So I'm gonna start with talking about uh, a project called the Radical Ocean Futures Project. Uh, this is a bit older now. Then I'm gonna talk about um, a game that uh, was developed over the past couple of years called Lagos 2199. And then I'm gonna talk about a project that was, is just gonna be published, I think later this week um, about the Arctic future. So radical ocean future, science fiction prototyping. So an overview of this project, uh, the purpose of this originally was to create four novel scenarios about the future of marine fisheries governance. Raise your hand if you've ever used the phrase marine fisheries governance, I figured. <laughs> okay, oh, but we've got a lot more. Okay, good, all right. But not everybody raised your hand, so hopefully you'll learn something. This was led by my good friend, Andrew Mary at the Stockholm Resilience Center. At the time, we were both PhD students. And the approach here, uh, he did something, uh, comprehensive literature review and synthesis manually, where he read a lot of texts and used his own brain to interpret what those texts, you'll understand later why I'm going to great lengths to explain that he did it himself with his, with his own wetware or his brain, you could call it. And then collectively together, we wrote four short stories about the future oceans. What does this look like? So he has all this insight, this literature in his mind. How do we make sense of that? Well, one way is to use this quadrant space. So on the x-axis here, we've got ecological sustainability or uh, uh, ecological collapse. On the y, we've got socially connected versus socially fragmented. All right, they're, they're unitless, right? But we can use that to organize information perhaps. So imagine you read a bunch of academic papers and the topics sort of shake out this way. This is one way to organize the information. Maybe you read about some industry trends. They distribute this way. And NGO reports, for example, this is just a cartoon of a process, okay? This can hopefully say, um, explain a bit of how you might organize this or interpret the information uh, to be distributed in such a way. From this, you can take these insights, see how they cohere together or not, and use a variety of different tools, which I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail later, about how you construct a world, a setting about the future. All of these things kind of conspire together to give you a sense of what the future could look like. So we did that, and rather than adopt a really explicit, systematic, structured process in this project, 
We just sort of went for it. So we did this where it was informed. This was the evidence base, particularly that Andrew had kind of curated hundreds of articles, uh, very deta detailed literature review. And then from that, we were inspired to write four stories about the future. The first one is called Back from the Brink. It's a story of generally a positive future, ecological sustainability, socially connected. This one is Fish Inc. This is a pretty, pretty dystopian story. It's uh, ecologically collapsed, but we society still manages to struggle on. This is all around a pretty bad story, Rhyme of the Last Fisherman. And then this one is a story where socially things don't go great, but some groups manage to live in a pretty ecologically sustained uh, situation under the water. And they also have four different narrative formats. This is a TED talk. This is a, an obituary. This is a ship's log. And this is a magazine article or whatever passes for a magazine article in 2100. So we did this, we wrote some short stories. We've got these silly little icons. But then Andrew got in touch with this uh, Swedish artist named Simon Stolenhag. Has anybody heard of Simon Stolenhag? Yeah, okay. So he's this pretty uh, phenomenal artist and he transformed our silly icons into these beautiful pieces of artwork. For money, we paid him. Um, and, and so we wrote these stories, we have this artwork and now what I want to do is I just want to, we're going to see if this works. This is why I was trying to get all set up. I don't know if this is going to work. So I'm going to mute myself here. I'm not sure if you're going to hear this out in Zoom land. I apologize about that. I'll make sure you can hear this recording later. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so, so the story is broadly about this kind of success of, of um, ecological sustainability and, and it charts the course of how we get there from the present day into the future. And so each story um, has this sort of narrative approach and you get a sense um, and, and a sense of the characters, a sense of the emotion, a sense of this journey that takes place from the present to the future. Now they're not all positive, but it's a way of depicting these different futures. Okay, so what's the impact of something like this? So it's the first time that I'd ever done anything with story-based futuring, um, science fiction prototyping. Um, and it's the first time as far as I know that it's been used in this way. Um, and so first off, it's not very often that an academic has anything featured kind of anywhere. Um, but this was, this was featured in Wired, the artwork specifically. So I wanna say that the artwork in this case turned it from like a normal academic interesting project and it turned it up to like 11 because of that, of that artwork, which is great because it was kind of like fabulously engaging. 
Um, it was also displayed, however, in a in kind of a policy relevant context. We've got this, uh, this is Andrew behind this delegate from Norway showing this work at the UN uh, meeting on the ocean, 2017. So this was one of two exhibitions that was uh, displayed at the United Nations in New York City. Um, and it was, uh, the artwork served as this vehicle to convey these future, future possibilities. And actually one of the coolest things in my view is that the folks at Nature saw fit to feature this at, in an editorial saying that scientists need to get better at telling science stories. And so the, the editorial was broadly about this work, this ocean's work, and just saying that we need, to, we need to kind of employ this method, use this method. At the time, Andrew and I were both a little bit like, well, we're not sure if this counts as research, but it's really fun. Um, and this helped us to feel like, no, this, this is actually legitimate. This is important, this is valuable. And also just as a side note, we did an AMA on Reddit and ask me anything if you, if you know what that is, where you show up and then anyone on the internet can ask you questions about this project. Probably the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> okay, so next project. Um, so that was that, that my first foray into science fiction prototyping is my first exposure to story-based futures. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Lagos 2199 uh, and in the context of climate futures. Also, uh, this is, this is gonna be about Lagos, Nigeria. It's pronounced, I think more or less Lagos, not Lagos, just in case. Pro tip, I got it wrong a lot. So an overview of this, the purpose of this project was to convey a far reaching complex African future. Uh, it was to blend climate impact projections with storytelling and to describe transformations in the face of sea level rise using a web-based game. You might say, well, why Lagos? Like, why would you choose that place? I teach a class on sea level rise here at CSU. I have a module on Lagos and I wanted to kind of up the game of that module. And so I thought, well, I didn't up the game figuratively and apparently literally with a game. Um, so the approach was uh, to use a sea level rise projection for 2200 in, in Lagos. This is the far future, 180 years from now. And uh, the purpose was also to engage, or the approach was to engage with African futurism, specifically Nigerian futurism. And, there, and that is a, that is a, a subgenre of African futurism. And the work is under review at Ecology and Society, but you can go read all about it if you want in a preprint. But this is hopefully better than reading a preprint. Um, so for example, this is, if you're not familiar, uh, Lagos is on, ooh, is there a white? Is there a, I could draw a map of Africa. I can't draw a map of Africa. I was gonna use that whiteboard. Um, it's, on, it's in West Africa. Um, and it's, it's depending on how you count the biggest city in Africa, Lagos is, uh, the metro area. And so what we're looking at here is one of many sea level rise viewing tools available for free on the internet, where you can zoom in almost anywhere on the planet, toggle the different metrics of like, how pessimistic or optimistic do you wanna be to understand what the future could look like. In this case, based on a variety of background research, we found that um, by 2200, using a pretty boring inter intermediate kind of middle of the road scenario of sea level rise, Lagos would be looking at around three meters of sea level rise. And which is a lot, by the way, that's like that, okay? Um, and, but this is not the extreme scenario by a long shot. So based on kind of annual flooding levels, and I think it was the intermediate uh, sea level rise run, this is what you can look at for, for, for uh, the changed coastline. And this is a profoundly changed coastline, right? All of this, may, people live in all of these places that are currently flooded. The Lekki Peninsula, this is a little bit less populated over here, but over here, densely populated area, super densely populated. In fact, there's this whole area of reclaimed land that's not even shown right now on the map. So this is the map from Climate Central, um, but we can't do much with this map aside from look at it and take a screenshot. So what I did is I, I did some, some, something I call GIS hacking, where you just change where the, coast, where the sea level is on a, on a digital elevation map, a digital elevation model in GIS. And so I essentially told the map to show that water is at three meters higher. So you get a sense of like, this is what three meters could look like. And just to prove not, that I'm not totally out to lunch, we can see that when we overlay this climate central map on top of this GIS kind of map, we see that it's more or less, it's very close. So what the advantage here is though, is now we've got a GIS map 
And anyone who does stuff with GIS knows that this can be an incredibly powerful tool for overlaying all sorts of other information. We can look at the current distribution of cities, roads, cultural landmarks, you name it. We can start to build a very clear picture of what parts of this coastline will be lost, or at least underwater, potentially three meters of water, and what parts won't be lost, okay? Now, if you're a sea level rise nut out there, that's cool, and you'll say, well, wait about, what about like the, the one in 10 year events or the one in 100 year events? How high could the water get? We didn't go there, okay? So in this case, this is what you would say get from global mean sea level with a, a little bit of the local dynamics. Uh, and that gets you to three meters. And so some of these places would be periodically flooded a bit more, but we're not, we're not really talking about that. The point is though, is that with all of that information, we can take this and now change the geography. We can project what the geography could look like into the future. So we've got this, and this was the easiest way I thought, like, I tried to do this on PowerPoint, and make it look all clean. And I thought sketching it out with, with, a, with a pen and paper was the easiest way to do it. So that's why it looks a little analog because it was. Um, so we've got a modified DEM. We update the geography here and we can start to build a hypothetical map of what Lagos 2199 could look like, all right? Then we can say, well, let's focus in on a couple clear areas so we can hear what I did as I said, let's choose three major urban, urban areas. So we have Lagos becomes Echo City. Echo is another name for Lagos or at least the region. Ikorodu becomes Ikorodu City and Lekki becomes New Lekki. Uh, and that sort of signals the fact that Lekki, the Lekki Peninsula has been profoundly changed, inundated and transformed. So the next step is then taking these three places and imagining what they could possibly look like in this far future. So we're in 2199, what does this place look like? That's where this comes in handy, where we can look around and see what is around this new future Lagos based on this potential GIS map, okay? This is all totally imaginative and subjective, all right? I will say this part isn't, right? This is mapping, this is based on sea level rise projections, this is based on GIS data. But starting there and forward, this is an imaginative process. It's formed, it's informed by the evidence base, but it's inherently an imaginative process. I wanna emphasize that. So then we do this, we imagine what the future could look like in these places. And then we use something called the Three Horizons Framework. Who's used the Three Horizons Framework? Maybe. So what this is, is it's, it's typically a way to envision desirable transformations in the future. Like you're, maybe you're an organization, you're a business and you wanna figure out like, how can we change from this thing that we don't like to get to something that we do like, all right? And it's a, it's a kind of a heuristic that helps you think through what those transitions could look like. But it's also used widely in the futures world. So right here, we can put our futuristic Echo City, Corridu and New Lecky over on this side. And we can say, well, this is a radically different place. What are the things that happen? So we work our way backwards. We fill in this future history, okay? So we can think about, well, the sea level rise has obviously gone up by three meters. Was it linear? Were these big catastrophic bursts? What did that look like? We can also think about what were the political changes? If there were these enormous climate impacts, sea level rise impacts in this place, it's unlikely that it would have been peaceful the entire time, all right? But then another thing that explicitly what we wanted to do is we wanted to tell an inherently positive future about Lagos and not just kind of fall into typical tropes. And so in this case, we thought about what if we told a story about what Lagos does to the world, not what the world does to Lagos. So what are some things that that could, that that could mean? What if Lagos was a leader in biotech that helped to address and actually mitigate uh, large scale carbon emissions climate sequestration or carbon sequestration and actually do some serious work addressing climate change. Well, that would be cool. So we, we built that into the story. So that's the kind of thing when I say we, we tried to have an explicitly positive or at least a um, not your typical spin on some of these kind of dystopian stories, particularly that take place in Africa. Based on this, we then have this new revised updated map enhanced with all this weird future stuff. And now we can say, let's do something with this. We've got this new possible map of what Legos could look like. Let's tell a story there. This is all preamble to telling a story. So along with that, we have this change geography. Those are those three places. And we can say, well, what's the point? Well, we can have a narrative goal that we want to tell a story about in each of these parts of this future Lagos Bay. Oops. And then we can zoom in on a specific sea level rise feature. So for example, um, up here, so we right there, we've got a Putu town right there. And we can talk about the social dimensions of climate refugees and climate migrants, okay? 
this whole column is all about the different aspects, things that can be talked about with regard to climate change impacts on society. But rather than doing it in a say, it's gonna happen in the future, this is in a way that's saying it's happened already. And what does it look like? Okay, this is 180 years in the future, remember. This is very, very, very far from now. Uh, this is as far from now as I think the Civil War is from the present, okay? It's that far. So we definitely got it all wrong. Like, don't, don't let me try and convince you that we got any of this right. The point though, let's go back to Kim Stanley Robinson, is to get a better perspective on now, okay? It's not to get it right in the future. It's to get a better perspective on that. So then uh, this was all designing the world, using GIS to inform that. And then I decided unwisely to try and learn how to make a game. So uh, this is called Twine. It's this freely available software that allows you to make story-based web games. And so it uses its own coding language. It also uses HTML and JavaScript. And this is, you're, you're looking at the architecture of what the game is. This is the map of the game. And inside of that is all this code that commands the instructions. Uh, I think several people in the audience helped troubleshoot this for me. I appreciate that. Uh, and lots of things are possible. I'm not gonna dig into this right now, but if you wanna talk more about this later, I'm happy to. You can do lots with Twine. You can have inventory systems. That's like the bag that you carry with you as a character. You can have conditional movement such that if you wanna go somewhere, you, you have to wait until you do X here before you can do Y. Um, and you can navigate by an image. So for, an exa for example, we took our GIS map and this is actually in the game. You can actually use this to move around Lagos Bay. Now on top of this, to propel the narrative forward, we had a whole bunch of characters that were developed. And so we start here and, and we pick up a businessman and it's actually a second person story. You are the ferry operator in this game. And so you are carrying these people around the bay. And as you interact with these passengers, you get to know what's happened to Lagos in the future, but you sort of get tricked into that because you're actually, it's a story that's unfolding as you play the game. So you actually learn what, the, what sea level rise has done how Legos has addressed climate change in the future, but because you're playing a game and you're actually experiencing a story along the way. And you might see that that's not my first name. It says Matthew Keys, not Patrick Keys. That's because I got to work with my older brother on this. He's not an academic. Um, he's just, uh, he's my older brother. He's a sci-fi nerd and he's a phenomenal artist. So he did all the character work, but then along the way, he also helped uh, design the story. And so this process that is based on this change geography, it's based on these characters propelling the narrative around so that you can explore what's happened in terms of sea level rise in this future Legos. It's based on a game. This is what the game itself looks like. And I was gonna click on that. We were gonna play some Legos 2199, but we just don't have time. Uh, I'll make sure that you can play it later. It's, it's freely available on the web. And this was a very iterative process. Now, you might say, isn't that spinning backward? Shouldn't it spin the other way? And that's intentional because it felt backward a lot of the time because it was such an iterative process that as we would, as I would get to this point doing design elements in the game, it changes maybe how the characters need to interact, which changes what they're gonna see and so forth. So it was a very iterative process. So what's the impact of this? Well, first and foremost, I actually, this is so typical. Um, I, I gave my students, I said, if you just come to my lecture on future stuff, 20 points, extra credit, no questions asked. You don't have to do anything, just show up. Nobody's here. Um, <laughs> um, but, but believe it or not, despite that, it was actually very effective, like conveying the ideas of sea level rise, conveying that. And I have a little survey that they take after they play the game. And they actually just the second year just got done playing the game uh, last week. And I have them take a survey to help me get feedback to improve the game. And it, it has helped them to envision the future of Legos. None of them have ever been there or I think only one student in two years has been to Africa at all. And so this is, is, this is a way for them to go somewhere else, to visit somewhere else, and to hopefully hear a story about sea level rise from a different perspective. That's not just doom and gloom, that's not just dystopian, and that hopefully sheds some of kind of the uh, colonial baggage that typically is associated with a lot of these stories. So beyond that, what's the other impact? Well, it was featured in a podcast. Um, and because of some of that like publicity, I was able to connect with some other folks. So I'm now working with Laura Pereira at the University of Watcherstrand, and she's leading, leading this African Futures Initiative, a decolonial futures initiative, uh, particularly using this thing called the Nature of Futures Framework. And then beyond that, and this is actually something that's just a lot of fun, is I was contacted by uh, a Nigerian scientist and, and PhD student who's studying in Belgium. 
And he's developing a whole slew of future-based sustainability games. Uh, this one is actually looking at um, a make-believe place called uh, Gondwana, uh, which is not make-believe in the past, but he's using that name to, to describe this community in Africa. And it's a game that explores systems thinking, one health, and, uh, and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and so there's all these sorts of cool things that are coming downstream from this project. Um, and last but not least, uh, Arctic Futures. This is um, a project that is just coming out now. It's gonna be published, I think, later this week. And the purpose of this one was to use uh, a new way to generate an evidence base. What's the evidence base? This is a new way to think about how do we even think about what the future could look like? And so in this case, I, I use a, a, something called a computational text analysis, which is a little bit like using a machine learning process on text. Um, and, it, and what we can do is we can use a computer to essentially read a lot of documents much more quickly than a person could and then extract core ideas from them. Uh, and hopefully the goal is to reveal kind of under discussed topics or ideas kind of in the scenario space, the futures space around the Arctic. You'll see this little logo here for the NSF because I uh, put together a, a pretty sweet NSF proposal for this. Um, and the idea was to use this approach, latent Dricklet, like latent Dricklet allocation and develop this method to connect directly to storytelling. So submitted this to NSF, had a sweet, awesome team. NSF said, no. Um, they gave me lots of feedback. Some of it was helpful, a lot of it wasn't. And so I took my awesome team and then condensed it down to a very small but still awesome team of just me and an undergraduate research assistant named Alexis Meyer. Um, which she, and originally she was just gonna lead this part, but then she ended up participating in the whole thing. And so what we did here is, is Alexis, I, sh I say we, Alexis did most of the hard work here. And we collected more than 2000 news articles about the future Arctic. So essentially, uh, we looked at these news sources, which come from the circumpolar Arctic region, uh, from every country is represented here that is part of the Arctic community, and then a few extras, or I should say um, part of the Arctic Council, that was sort of the filter. And then we collected all these articles, and then we converted into machine readable text, that is to say plain text, that a computer, uh, some computer software could easily interpret. And then we let this, um, this algorithm loose on this, on this database of text. So essentially, rather than saying, I'm gonna go read 2058 news articles, and rather than Alexis going to read 2058 news articles, we let this algorithm do it. And from that, you can actually have, and this is, this is not new, by the way, this, this has been around for ages, this sort of computational text analysis. From that, you can get a bunch of topics. You can extract some core themes from this, this corpus of literature. So this is a visualization of that. So there were, um, and using a bunch of, um, uh, statistical metrics to make sure that this was the most robust set of topics, blah, blah, blah. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, we said 11 was the best number. And it turns out that we still got rid of this 11th one because it was like two orders of magnitude less important than the other clusters. So we have 10. What does this mean, right? You're just looking at numbers on this like arbitrary quadrant space. Uh, what you can take from this is that these clusters of ideas are more closely connected and these are less well connected. Okay, that's enough for right now. And what this is, is each cluster is represented by a whole list of keywords. So in this case, this is 30 keywords that sort of describe the entire corpus. But let's zoom in on a specific one. So we're gonna zoom in on, on topic five right here. These are the words, I need you to read every single word right now. Uh, these are the words that describe topic five. And, and what we did also on top of this was we assign a label to this quadrant space. We actually used this information. You don't have to use this. Is, this is sort of arbitrary topic space and the, the algorithm decides, okay, this is how related they are. This is just the visualization that they use. I think my Fitbit is telling me that I'm going for a swim right now. Yep, um, I'm not swimming. <laughs> um, but it's, so it's saying that, so we use this to say uh, X axis is, this is expected climate change. That is to say, uh, plausible, probable, uh, projected. Okay, this is kind of normal climate change. This would be maybe more preposterous climate change. Maybe not quite ice-free Antarctica, but definitely uh, Thwaites is melting a lot, for example. Okay, now we've got high-low. This is cooperation. So this would be lots of conflict in the Arctic, um, lots of cooperation in the Arctic. Okay, so with that, and the reason I'm going through this is saying this is the all this is the quantitative objective process. This is the evidence base, new way of coming up with an evidence base to feed into a story. All right, but we have to now connect this to telling a story. This is just words, and 
some topic distributions. So what we do first is we say, okay, well, this exists in this quadrant space as a place of expected climate change and low cooperation, all right. Now we can go over here and summarize the keywords. We say, okay, well, it's characterized by maybe industrial development, extraction, finance, agreements, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's distill it down. It's an extractive industrial art, okay? What this does is it allows us to now, and we, we don't lose the words, we're not, we're not losing that per se, but this allows us to sort of interpret this and start scooping it into a world building process. What is world building? It's the process of creating a setting, okay? I mentioned this earlier that uh, with that Radical Ocean Futures project that we just sort of, we just went for it. We didn't have a necessarily a structured process. This was highly structured where what we did is we took those words and we start thinking about systematically, how do these words connect with one another? How could we start to construct what this future could look like? That's this step up here. I, I talked about uh, the three horizons framework already for Lagos 2199. We use the same framework in this case, where we put this future extractive industrial Arctic over on this end. And we fill in this future history, okay? And then, and then these other two steps over here are, we zoom out. So probe reality, what's, the, what's happening in the broader context of the world? And then over here, we, we push towards ridiculous. This is Jim Daytour's thing, okay? So for example, indentured service for climate migrants as a pathway to corporate citizenship. That doesn't sound very awesome. Maybe a little bit preposterous. That's good. We want it to be preposterous in, this, in that area. So we did this, let's see. Yeah, we did this for all 10 clusters. So we went th through a separate world building process, a separate futuring process to generate this sort of background for each one. And on top of that, we have to tell a story, right? So we have to develop a character. We have to develop a plot. I'm not gonna go into how to do that today. Um, and, but we also followed a similar structured process for that. And so I'm gonna give you just a couple excerpts uh, of this story. I think we're almost there, said Esther. Maybe just another day or two, Misha smiled. This was their daily game. Walk 15 miles through the wilderness of Northern Canada and speculate about their unknown destination. All right, we get a sense. This is the main character's name is Misha. Okay, this is a third person story. By the way, don't expect like Hugo award-winning science fiction when, you're, when I'm up here, like this is, I'm not, I'm not gonna try and win any awards. This is just a way to then to tell a story about the future. Just wanna make that clear. Um, even though I've, I've, I've littered my talk with Hugo award-winning authors. Um, so Misha snapped away, carefully watching her pockets as she exited the packed loop and followed the crowd of gray clad workers down the platform. Nobody rushing to get to work, the slow measured steps shuffling the same well-trod path toward the pits. A few drones floated together overhead, almost as though they were on a smoke break, seeking idle conversation. So you're starting to get a sense maybe of what this future could look like. It's, it's not, this isn't a great future. Okay, this is the weird excerpt. They each took a seat facing away from one another and carefully placed their arms in the armrests. Misha began the activation sequence. She could feel a part of her mind go elsewhere. She closed her own eyes and heard the gentle metallic snick as the swarms enclosed in her sleeves woke up and began seeking promising signatures in the rock. She remembered the explanation from her trainer that the swarm intelligence wasn't actually inside her head. It was just leveraging the raw power of the human brain to perform complex computations, but it still felt like the swarm was in her mind, okay? This is weird, right? Okay, this should, this should read kind of strangely. So that was a bunch of words. I've explained the process of how you come up with a story a little bit, um, but it turns out there's a better way to do this. It's called art, okay? So for each story, we also had a piece of artwork pr uh, produced to accompany the story, to sort of complement what we came up with. And hopefully you can see here some of these ideas I just communicated. So this is Misha over here. She's plugged into her chair. It's hard to see it based on the lights and everything, but she's sort of glassed over. The idea is that she's plugged into this apparatus that's allowing her to um, exist in this, this, mine, this uh, subterranean mine. If you zoom in, you can, if you look closely, it says rare earth elements. So this is a rare earth element mine. The whole point, the basis of this story is to explore the fact that we're still gonna need a ton of rare earth elements in the future to continue our industrial lifestyles and that uh, one way to do that is with this futuristic mining technology. So we did this again for all 10 stories. So there's four, these are just four more of the stories that we did. Um, and, and actually along the way, Alexis was, Alexis was originally just gonna collect all those texts. And then um, I did the computational text analysis. I said, thanks Alexis. By the way, are you interested in, you know, being plugged into the storytelling process? She said, sure, I'll have, I'll have a try. She ended up writing two of the stories. 
Uh, so this is one of her stories. It's called The Last Preserve. It's about a, a big futuristic conservation effort. Um, and then there's another story that she wrote. So what's the impact of this? Well, it's hard to say because it's just coming out this week. Um, but it's, I'm already adopting it for two more projects and it's inspired a bunch of new methods. Um, so it, there was a source article today, actually. So if you go check the source, you can see a bunch more of the art um, and hear from Alexis. But then it's also inspired a new master's thesis. So at the Stockholm Resilience Center, she actually, this is cantaloupe because she started last year when it was still a preprint, still is a preprint. And, and I started, she contacted me, I said, you sure you wanna do this? You know, this is not even published yet. She said, yeah, it's pretty good. And my advisors think it's a good idea. I thought, okay. Um, so she's actually running with it, but she's exploring um, future uh, biodiversity on the high seas. That's areas beyond national jurisdictions, kind of the, the lawless high seas. And she's using this method to explore what that can look like in the future. So what have we learned from all this? This is Charlie Jane Andrews. She's a, a sci-fi author. Uh, we should live every day as if you've come back in time from a dystopian future to try and prevent everything from breaking. If you've read anything by her, this is how she writes. Um, but I, I like this quote. So we take our futures cone and we've got all of these different possibilities, right? Okay, um, I, sh I shouldn't say possibilities. We have all of this potential, okay? And all of these practices of futures work is to try, and like Kim Stanley Robinson said, get a better perspective on now, okay? We shouldn't be thinking about getting it right. That's not the point. The point is to see a little bit more clearly what could happen based on now. So what is the most useful approach? Academic paper, a short story, some artwork, what's the best way? It's a trick question. They each have the role to play, okay? So some of these, so an academic paper, this is necessary. We are gonna propel our understanding forward. This is sort of a backstop to make sure you're not just coming up with the exact same stuff every time. This helps us to ensure that we're coming up with some sort of scholarly novelty. It's not a bad thing. But I always use my mom. My mom's not an academic. She's not gonna read that. Well, she, she might read that actually, um, but she would prefer this. She would prefer a short story. If we're gonna convey what this future could look like, a short story is a fantastic way to convey to other people who are maybe not an expert and maybe want to explore what a future could look like. And of course, art can be very useful. It's a visual phrase. If any of these things was like posted on a wall while you're walking down college, the art might make you stop. This would probably not, you might walk faster if you saw a journal article blown up on the wall. So I'm not gonna dig into this. I just, this is sort of summarizing what the contributions have been uh, in terms of different. So expanding the evidence base, these are different ways that we've expanded or I've helped contribute to expanding, thinking about how we expand the evidence base for story-based futures both through computational text analysis and using climate change impacts as a starting point, not as an end point, right? Climate change impacts are often thought about as like, this is what's gonna happen. Okay, cool, let's use that now. We start with that, all right? Now let's explore that as the starting point. And other global change applications, I have a colleague at University of Michigan using this in his uh, wildlife and society class, thinking about half earth conservation, what would happen if we allocated half of the terrestrial surface of the earth to, to, uh, to be conserved? That's a perfect topic for science fiction prototyping or story-based futuring. So another thing is that through all of this work, I've, I've managed to refine this method down that it can be taught less than a day. It's a reproducible approach in terms of the story-based part. Uh, it can be broadly used. So I've used this with, well, with education a lot. Uh, all my classes that I teach use this. I've used it with practitioners, uh, with community members, uh, with experts, it's a, it's a very portable approach to thinking collectively about the future. And then what can these do? So first off, story-based scenarios enable synthetic problem-based learning. Uh, it's, I have not come across a better tool, especially when we think about anything related to the future, uh, sustainability being one of those topics, uh, that is better than this for allowing students to bring together lots of different kinds of information. But also there's a pretty cool project uh, where um, I'm gonna be a part of in the, in the coming months, where we can use scenarios to better explore what are the possibilities? So we can explore what the possibilities of say climate intervention or geoengineering might be. What are the circumstances that might lead to that? And then what might happen uh, if those things, that those circumstances and the, the actors do these things, what might that actually look like from an actual simulation perspective? And how does that feed back into thinking about the future? if we can then feed that insight back and understanding what that means uh, for society. So that's an example. This is a, a new category of futures application of trying to actually blend it with uh, 
uh, the production of new scientific information. So final thoughts, uh, creative approaches to scenario design unlock new ways of thinking about the future of global environmental change. Uh, Story-based scenario creation can be blended with many sources of evidence. That was sort of an open question. And hopefully today I've shared a few ways of how we can generate stories, not just from our own imaginations, but from lots of different sources of quantitative information as well. And, and finally, artistic collaboration can really multiply the engagement and outreach of scenario efforts. And with that, that's it. And I think we've got some time for a few questions, I think. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, please. Go back. Um, I work with the Forest Service on their resource planning in Africa. And so we have kind of the buzzword on the resource planning in Africa is every 10 years we put out kind of projections for 50 years on the natural resources in the United States. And so the next 2020 report is the course of the that come out here soon. Um, but one of the things we always struggle with is how to actually make of our scenarios and our models kind of salient to either decision makers or public. Yeah. Makers. I feel like there are some possibilities here on how we could potentially do that, but we're kind of constrained in our scenarios. Can we use this? How do we kind of, do the scenarios come first or do you kind of run the models first? Yeah, I think what I, I mean, if I had like carte blanche, then what I would probably do is I would say, well, let's start with some stories. Let's start with some sort of visioning process about what we, what we, what is the, what do we think forestry might look like? What do we think the forest might look like? How might we use forests, et cetera? And based on that, I bet you would get to some novel endpoints, just the story part, especially if you envision how we're using forest. And then based on that, you might be able to say, oh, well, we weren't even thinking that, you know, wildfire regimes would rip through and we wouldn't even have forest in this place anymore, or that uh, build out of these uh, different uh, residential zones would totally change the distribution of forest in this way, et cetera. And because of that, that might actually change the, the whole simulation process. So if you could do it that way, it doesn't have to be like super, you know, multi-year process. You could do that in a few afternoons. And then from that story part, you could generate new ways of even thinking about the simulations and of what you're going to model. And then at the end of that, you could then generate another set of stories to say, okay, we modeled it. This is what we found could happen. Um, and that is sort of, it's, it mirrors what I was just mentioning towards the end with that climate intervention stuff, where that's what the, that's sort of the goal there is we generate some scenarios about possible climate intervention strategies, you know, if we have some rogue actors, some geopolitical actors that try and do something, well, let's understand what the impacts to the climate, to the earth system could be, and then feed that back into the story itself. So I would probably say start with the stories, because you'll probably have some novelty there that you might not realize you could then explore with the simulations, and then come back to the stories at the end as an idea. And then hire some cool artists, because that always helps. Other questions? Yeah. That was such a Thanks. Um, just a, a question. I think kind of related to that, but a bigger picture. Like you said a couple times, you know, the, the point is not to get it right. The point is to teach me to think in the present. But like, is there a place for trying to get it? So the question is, um, while it's fun to think about it, not in the restrictive way of trying to get it right, couldn't we try and get it right some of the time? And what would, how would that change things? Um, so I absolutely agree. So like, if we're trying to think about it from a story perspective, and, but if we're still trying to tackle this sort of uh, possible, preposterous, preferable space, then, well, let's take the preferable, right? So if we abandon that whole other framing from everything from projected out to preposterous, but we just take preferable, um, it, I, I can't go all the way back in the, in the talk, but preferable extended from the projected out to the preposterous, okay? And so, and since I know you, 
you're probably thinking about resource management and, and, and maybe conservation and other topics like that. But even if we think more broadly, that's, that's entering the preferable space. That's sustainability in thinking about like, I prefer this state, I don't prefer that one. That's like our injection of norms and values. Because of that, um, I think there's, there's value in just coming up with some preposterous scenarios. But I think when we start talking about sustainability, we start talking about agency, we start talking about capacity, we start talking about how those things maybe that we would want to have in the future um, are potentially endpoints of some process. Like we might not have the capacity now, we might not have the state now that we want, but you can use this to then chart a course toward that. So that future need not be preposterous. That could just actually be possible. It could be plausible even, but there might not be a lot of evidence to get us there yet. So we don't have to strain to the preposterous necessarily. Now, that answer though, if we're talking about it being useful and practical is inherently connected to stakeholder engagement. It's inherently connected to actually talking with people that know what they're doing on the ground in this place that could be affected, um, whether that be, um, a community in the mountains like Steamboat, whether it's Fort Collins, whether it's Palau, whether it's wherever, um, you can't actually do that work to understand something useful unless you're working with the people who might use it, right? And so that's that's actually, honestly, that's a, a kind of a frontier when it comes to sustainability applications of this method. This, this, this method's used all the time in like story-based futures. That's what Hollywood is a lot of the, in a lot of ways. Um, they hire people that are futurists to come up with preposterous visions of the future, uh, and then they make movies and a lot of money. When it comes to sustainability, it's still a frontier to say, well, what organizations might actually be interested in using this in a way that actually enhances their ability to achieve sustainability-oriented goals, okay? Whether it be an institution or an organization, an NGO. Like, this is, a, this is something that you can use that to then identify the preferable space and the not preferable space, right? Um, and that can be everything, like I said, from that very boring projected domain of that potential cone all the way out to the preposterous. But it really depends on the people that are in the room thinking about their future in a way. Not sure if that answers. Okay, okay. Any other questions? We are one minute shy of four o'clock, so I want to honor that if you got to take off. I won't be offended in any way because we're at time. But I'm... I didn't, I didn't schedule anything for 401, so uh, I can answer more questions. Say it again? Right, so it's a small enough group that I can just tell everybody here. I'm running a workshop, it's specifically oriented at faculty um, and people that are gonna probably maybe teach classes. Um, and the idea is I'm gonna be running a workshop on Wednesday afternoon uh, for about two hours from one to three, thank you. Um, and, and it's gonna be hands-on, fast-paced. We're actually gonna do this. We're gonna do, we're not gonna do the whole thing, right? And I, I'm not gonna have like an artist out there like scribbling a sweet picture, um, but we're gonna actually do some world building. We're gonna do some, develop kind of um, a scaffold of how you actually do this, kind of get your hands dirty futuring, so to speak. Um, and so if you're interested, let me know. Um, there's a limit to the space, but let me know and we'll see if we can make it happen if you wanna join it uh, because, um, there is still some room right now, um, but if but it is sort of oriented towards um, kind of instructors, faculty type thing. Good. Okay. Any other questions though? I mean, I talked about a lot of stuff, so um, yeah, Lynn. I'm not sure anyone is still on Zoom right now, uh, but the question was, how do you navigate the idea of preferable, um, especially when you've got lots of different definitions of what preferable could be, especially if they contradict one another. Is that fair? Sure. Um, 
So in my view, one of the first things that you do in that case is you sort of surface those preferences. Um, so rather than like just passing by them and not acknowledging that people might have different preferences, you actually say, okay, well, what are our preferences? What do we care about? Um, and you can, then you can navigate that in a number of different ways. Um, you can do futuring in parallel. You don't have to do it. So you can, I could do it with everyone in this room where we're all talking about futures, but everybody comes up with their own future. And so in this case, we would have, I don't know, 15 different futures. Um, or you can do it collaboratively, right? Then maybe we form small groups and then maybe we only have four futures. Or in this, I don't think I would try and do this. We have one future for everybody in this room. Um, I think the more you try and condense it down and get everybody on the same page personally, I'm not sure that's the most valuable approach. I think it's probably more important to have everybody surface their definitions of preferable, maybe come together individually, if not in small groups, to then explore what futures could be. Because if you keep coming together, it's gonna make it a lot harder to make it strange, which is very important actually with this type of process. Um, and it's also gonna sort of cancel out the uh, contradictions. Our world is riddled with contradictions, right? Like we have so many contradictions in our current reality. And so if we try and control for those and cancel them out, we're gonna end up with futures that might not actually be that useful because they won't be ridiculous. They won't contradict each other in whether it be political ways, technological ways, social ways, you name it. Um, I mean, we don't need to go into that, but I'm sure we could all think of lots of contradictions that probably shouldn't exist in our current societies, our economic systems, et cetera, and, and yet they do. And so when we think about the future, when we try and control for that contradictoriness, that's a little bit counterproductive because then we, we want to end up at a future that does have contradictions, that explores that, like that doesn't make any sense. Well, good, because our future, our present doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, and so to navigate that, but at the, at the outset though, it is important to make sure everybody, especially if you've got a diverse group of people that they have a chance to lay that out. And honestly, the best way to do that is individually. Um, you can share that voluntarily, but having a chance to then explore your futures as they exist within your definition of preference, then I think that actually enables at the end of it, it can also lead to a, a greater diversity of futures, which is actually pretty valuable. So that's, there's lots of ways to handle it. And it also depends on what you're trying to do. Um, like if, you're, if you've got a specific objective that you have to deliver one future, well, okay, you gotta deliver one future. Uh, but if you have the freedom to explore kind of the, the whole space, then I think it's better to, rather than constrain people into a group, let them sort of explore the weirdness. Honestly, um, I just did a, an expert workshop last week and with, I think it was 12 different people from lots of different disciplines, all thinking about water, but that was the only unifying thing. We ended up with wild, way different things that I would have thought possible at the beginning, that just on my own, by letting these people kind of trace their own courses through their own disciplinary backgrounds and all their own kind of cultural um, perspectives as well, so. All right, everybody in Zoom land, that's a wrap.